We are in book four of the Aeneid, and Aeneas and his Trojans are accompanying Dido and her Carthaginians on a hunt. Venus and Juno have already conspired to wed the two with a storm, and that's where we find ourselves when we begin. And we begin with the awesome alliteration of M's. Magno murmure is an ablative of manner, following off from the present passive infinitive miscere, to be mixed. In fact, this line is almost identical to book one, line 124, when Neptune arrives on the scene of the storm. Only in this case, the storm has just begun, and that's the incipit in the next line. We continue with an ablative absolute, comixta grandine. While the sense is that a cloud mixed with hail follows, grammatically, it's a cloud with hail mixed in. The polysyndeton, multiple or even excessive conjunctions, gives us a list of people in the next two lines. The main verb is the syncopated perfect tense petiere below, but don't worry about that just yet. We need the list of our subjects first. Line 162 gives us two different peoples, the uh, Tyrians or Carthaginians, and then the Trojans, here described with the collective noun Juventus. This person, the Dardanios Nepos Veneris, is Ascanius, or Iulus. He's Venus's grandson. Diversa modifies tecta, a neuter accusative plural. These are just shelters from the rain, and metu is an ablative of cause. The rest of the line illustrates the stormy scene. Line 165 gives us a wonderful and famous chiasmus. The accusatives speluncum e andem are on the outside, and dido dux et troianus are the nominatives on the inside, the subjects of de veniunt. Although you should really see that the troianus modifies dux, the Trojan leader is of course Aeneas, Virgil's juxtaposition of dux next to dido recalls an earlier description of dido in Book 1, when Venus is giving us her backstory, and how about how Dido organized the flight from Tyre. She is the dux femina facti. The woman is the leader of the deed. So Dido dux here is entirely appropriate, and we can read this as both Dido and the Trojan leader, as well as Dido the leader and the Trojan man. The chiasmus illustrates the actual physical act. Dido and Aeneas are literally inside of the same cave. The rest of this section gives the guests at the wedding, or wedding. There's a polysyndeton here, and Tellus, Mother Earth, is referred to with prima because she's legitimately the first goddess. Juno is the pro nuba. The, this is an epithet of Juno, the goddess of marriage. But it's also the term used for the woman who makes the necessary arrangements for the wedding, kind of like a bridesmaid today. The signum given here is likely the start of the ceremony. Fulsere is a syncopated third-person plural perfect tense, and these ignes are probably lightning. Aiter is the heavens, and when combined with the tellus above, we should think of the myth of, well, using the Greek names, Gaia and Uranus, the earth and the sky. Aiter is the witness, that's conscius, with the date of conubis, depending on that. Finally, we have the nymphs howling and sumo modifies vertice, an ablative of location. Ulularunt, an obvious onomatopoeia, since that's what howling sounds like, is a syncopated perfect tense form. We conclude this section with a bit of commentary from the poet and foreshadowing too. The main point connects that first day with primus duplicated for emphasis, with causa, which takes the genitives leiti and malorum, Dido is the subject of the passive present moetur, accompanied by the ablatives of means specie and fama, appearance and rumor. The meditatur in 171 is a deponent verb. Translate this as Dido considers, and, or nor does she consider, since we have our neque neither, followed by the neck nor. Furtium modifies amorem. And in the last line, put quotes around the conjugium. She calls it, quote, marriage. Hoke is ablative, modifying nomine, and it's an ablative of means. The culpa here is probably a sense of fault, breaking her vow of chastity to her dead husband, Sychaeus. It's also a reference to line 19 in this book, where Dido tells Anna that she could perhaps succumb to this one fault, or culpa, by falling in love and pursuing that with Aeneas. Probably not related, but maybe, is the fact that Catullus often refers to his girlfriend's infidelities as a culpa, 
and Dido is in effect breaking a vow to her husband in cheating on him. So we have this wedding, and this was entirely planned out by Juno and Venus. In fact, they described this passage kind of word for word 50 lines before. Here, compare the two passages. I've highlighted the similarities. Only when Juno is speaking, she uses the future tense, and it's easy to change from the future to the present when we're dealing with third and fourth conjugation verbs. The metrical quantities, the scanning in the words stays the same. You can also wonder if this actually is a wedding. Virgil does a great job of depicting it as such, and we have our bridesmaid and Juno, the wedding torches are lightning bolts, the sky is the witness, and the nymphs sing the wedding hymn. But later on, our poet hints that she's mistaken. She only calls it a marriage, but she's wrong, because she uses this to just cover up for her own mistake. And what does Aeneas think? That's a question for a different time. Next up, rumor of the union between Aeneas and Dido runs through the cities of Africa. 